Hi everyone, this is Amy Johnson Crow, and welcome to this week's Archives.com live stream. This week we are going to ask the question, how good is that record? We're going to take a look at evaluating sources. Now it's important to keep in mind as you're researching your family history that not all sources are created equal. And it's better to accept the fact sooner rather than later that not all records are completely accurate. And if you accept everything at face value, you can really create a mess with your family tree. Pretty soon you have mothers who are, you know, three years old when they're, when they're having children. You have children who are born after both of their parents have died. You have someone who is born in, in a place that didn't exist at the time of their birth. You can just create a real mess if you just take everything at face value. You really need to take a look at whatever record, whatever source you're looking at, and evaluate it to see how accurate it might be. See how much weight, how much credence you should be giving that particular source. couple key concepts that I want to introduce here very early on in our time together today. Key concept number one, the longer it takes to record an event, the more likely there is to be an error. I mean, just think about it, it's human nature, people forget. You know, if, if you ask me what I had for dinner, you know, last Wednesday, I'm not going to be able to tell you, I don't remember. If you ask me what I had for breakfast this morning, I can tell you. That's a lot closer than dinner last Wednesday. So just, you know, kind of keep that in, in the back of your mind as you're looking at records that the longer it took for someone to write it down or to, you know, somehow record that event, the more likely there is to be an error. You also have the problem of an uninformed person giving the information. And we'll take a look at a few examples of that here in just a moment. Key concept number two. The further away you are from the original record, the more likely there is to be an error or an omission. Now, it could be something like a typo. You know, you have the original record and someone's creating an index or they're creating an abstract of that record. You know, maybe they transpose a couple of numbers they might have misread some handwriting. And they might have left some information out, either on purpose or by accident, or it just wasn't something that they were going to include when they're putting together this index or this abstract. So the further away you are from that original, the more likely there is to be something wrong or for there to be something missing. The analogy I like to use for this scenario is to think back when perhaps you were a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout. I know this was something that we did when I was in Girl Scouts, and we would sit around a circle and we would play telephone. And the, the Scout mother would start a very simple sentence, like, my mother went to the store. And she would whisper to the girl next to her, who would whisper to the girl next to her who would then whisper to the girl next to her, and it would go all the way around the circle. And it was always so much fun to see how a simple sentence, like, my mother went to the store, changed to something like, the chicken was on the roof. You know, that's kind of an extreme example, but I think it illustrates very well how every time that something changes format, or something changes somehow, somehow you're recording it in a different way, there is a possibility for it to change. So when you're thinking about how much weight to give a particular piece of information, how much weight to give that source that you're looking at, think like an investigative reporter. And we've all seen these questions when we were, you know, taking high school English classes or college English classes. You know, ask yourself the who, what, when, where, why, and how. If you think about those questions, keep those in mind, then you're going to be able to really question how much weight you should give to that source. 
So just keep that basic premise in mind, something that you've been taught all your life. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. Death certificates. Death certificates are probably some of the most complicated sources that there are because you have two different people usually giving information. Some of it is recorded at the time of the death. Some of it is recorded long after the event, like the birth. So here we have a death certificate for George Crow, who died in Fairfield County, Ohio. And this information over here on the right-hand side is the information that was given by the doctor. It's the information about the death. It's the date of death. It's the cause of death. Uh, when this information was recorded. So we see that he died May the 17th, 1932, and the doctor is signing the death certificate on the 19th. Sometimes you'll see it actually recorded the same day. So this death information is something that is given by the doctor. He has that information. He knows what happened. He knows when George Crow died, and he knows where he died, and he knows what caused his death. So that's all very, very good information. We should put a lot of weight on that particular information. It was given by someone who knows the facts, and it was recorded very, very close to the time of the event. Now compare that to the information on the left-hand side of the certificate. This is information that was given by his daughter. So this information is recorded long after these particular events, such as his birth date. It's 102 years later. It's not exactly recorded at the time that, that he was born. Um, information about his birthplace. You know, obviously his daughter was not there when he was born. So how accurate is that information? Would his daughter have known the names both first, last name, and the, the maiden name of her grandmother. You know, would she have known? So all of this is kind of a roundabout way of saying, use this information here on this side, this information about his birth, the information about his parents. Use this information as clues, not necessarily as facts. We'll, we will want to do more research to see if we can find other records, better records, that can either refute or corroborate the information that's given on George Crow's death certificate. Now let's compare that to Linton Johnson's death certificate. The information about his birth and about his parentage was given by his wife. Linton, Linton Johnson's wife, Margaret, is the one who is giving this information. So she actually knew Linton's parents. She knew Eber. She knew Anne. So I would place more weight on this information than some other information that we might see that was given by one of Linton's children, because Margaret actually knew Eber and Anne. Now, she may not have accurately known Anne's maiden name, but I'm going to give pretty good weight to at least the first names being correct. Census records. Census records can be a little tricky because except for the 1940 census, you don't know who gave the information to the census taker. It could have been the head of household. It could have been the spouse of the head of household. It could have been one of the children. It could have been the hired hand. It could have been the person next door. You just don't know who gave the information. You don't know who was talking to that census taker. So you can't evaluate how much they knew. You can't really evaluate how much they knew and how accurate that information is that they're giving. And you also need to think about how truthful were they with the census taker. You know, 
on some of the early censuses where they're asking about property values and things like that, you know, do they really want to tell the census taker, yes, I have $10,000 worth of personal property? Mm, maybe, maybe not. So, you know, how truthful were they with the census taker? So here's an example from the 1900 census and pointing out that the columns over here where they're asking about the person's birthplace and the birthplace of the father and the mother, you don't know who's giving this information. So do we know for sure that, that John's birthplace was in Norway, his father was born in Norway, and his mother was born in Italy? How accurate is it that, that Kate was born in Ohio, her father was born in Pennsylvania, and her mother was born in Ohio? We just don't know. How accurate is it that John arrived in the United States in 1867? You know, again, we can use these as clues. We can use them as really good starting points. But we need to find other information to go along with this. We need to find other sources, some better sources for this information. Pension records. I love military pension records. And here's an example from a Civil War pension record. And it's a declaration by the widow. In other words, the widow, the, the Civil War veteran has died and his widow is now applying for a pension based on his service. So again, this is the statement by the widow. And she's giving information about his service and she's also giving information about the marriage because she has to prove that she's the widow. So she has to prove that, that there was a marriage. So keep in mind, she has a pretty compelling reason to lie. So, you know, are they just going to take her word for it that she really was married to this veteran who is now deceased? So just because she says that they were married in October of 1859 in New York, you know, I don't think that the government is, is going to just take her at her word. Oh, she says that they were married. They must have been married. Let's, let's give her the pension. And in fact, that's not how it worked. She would make the declaration, but she would also have to back it up. And in this case, because New York wasn't filing civil marriage records at the time, she got a notarized statement from the minister at the church. And he went through and he makes a statement, I find in the record of the First Methodist Episcopal Church of this place the following entry. Marriages, October 18, 1859, James Cranston and Mary Owens. This is an exact certified copy of their marriage record. And here it's signed by the pastor. And down here is the statement by the notary public. So here we have something that it's still not quite the best record because it's a copy of what was in the church register. You know, we're not seeing the actual church register, but this is a much better source than just her saying, yeah, we were married. So this is something where we're getting a little bit closer to that original source. And again, the statement is being made by the pastor, and he has no reason to lie about what is in his marriage records there at the church. Okay, county histories. County histories are wonderful. They have so much information. But sometimes in our excitement, we can put a little bit too much weight on them. Here's an example from a book called The Shenandoah Valley Pioneers and Their Descendants. And this book was published in 1909. And if you look at this particular entry, it talks about Joseph, the sixth child of Samuel Glass, the emigrant, who was born in Ireland 1722, lived at Greenwood, died June the 12th, 1794. And it goes on to tell about where he lived and, you know, all of his, his wives and all of their children and, and all of that. But this man was born in 1722 died in 1794, 
and this is being written in 1909. We have no idea who gave this information. We don't know where this information came from. You know, did they pull this out of a family Bible? Did they pull this out of someone's memoirs? Did someone in 1908 just decide to write all this down? We don't know. But this is so long after the events. You know, whoever is writing this, unless they're getting information from something that would have been recorded at the time of these events, you know, we really shouldn't take this necessarily as a fact but instead use it as clues. Now, compare that to another biography in the same book, Still the Shenandoah Valley Pioneers from 1909. But here we're talking about Nathaniel, the youngest son, is, is a lieutenant in the regular army stationed in the Philippines, talks about him seeing active service in the Spanish-American War, that he's been married twice, and it lists both of his wives and that he has two children. Okay, so that is very contemporary information. This is information that, you know, the person who wrote this could have had firsthand knowledge. It was just a few years before this book was published that these events would have been happening. So I would put more weight on something like this, something like this biography where it is very contemporary to when it's being published than we saw in that earlier example with the biography of the man who lived in the 1700s. Published information can be tricky. And when I say published information, I don't mean just books. I mean books, websites, databases, anything that has been taken from something else. Ask yourself if you can get back to the original record. And if you can, do it. Because, again, the books, the websites, these databases, anything that's published, any time that a record changes format, you have an opportunity for errors to creep in and for things to be left out. So they're great. We, w we wouldn't be able to do family history research without published information. But when things really aren't making sense, you know, ask yourself, can you get back to that original record? So here's an example of something that would be considered published information. This is a record out of the archives.com Arizona death records. And if you look at this entry for William P. Brown, it's giving his birthplace, his death date, where he died, and it's giving information about both of his parents. And that's great. You find this and you're probably doing the genealogy happy dance. But where I see a lot of people make a mistake, they get this great information and it's all spelled out for them right there, they don't take that extra step to click and view the image. And if you click and view the image on this record, you see that original death certificate. So you're seeing all of the information that is there. And you can evaluate it better because you also get the name of the informant. So, you know, is this a spouse giving information? Is it a child giving information? That's going to really help us evaluate how accurate the information, especially about his birth and his parentage, how accurate that information is. So again, whenever you have something that's published, ask yourself, can I get back to the original? And if you can, do it. So when you're considering, evalu when you're evaluating evidence, you really need to consider all of it. What I mean by that is, take a look at that source. How long did it take? How long was it? How long was it created after the event? You know, was it two days later? Was it 20 years later? And did it come from another source? Consider the information that you're reading. Was the person who gave that information knowledgeable? And were they being truthful? And also think about the evidence. Does that record, does that evidence that you're reading really say what you say it does? Or are you reading more into it than what's actually there? You need to look at all three of these things, the source, 
the information, and the evidence. When you are confronted with conflicting information, and note that I say when and not if, because if you are doing genealogy, it's just a matter of time before you come across two sources that are giving information about the same event, but they don't agree. So when you're confronted with conflicting information, give more weight to the source with the better informant that was created closer to the event and that has not been taken from another record. You know, ask yourself, you know, is there something better about this record than this other record? And finally, two last points. And I've said this before, but I think it bears repeating. Always ask yourself if you can get to a better record. And my last point, evaluating evidence is not a democracy. This has been stated many times by a lot of noted genealogists, and I think it's a great way of encapsulating evaluating evidence. Evaluating evidence is not a democracy. And what I mean by that is, just because you have four sources that say X, and one source that says Y, it doesn't automatically mean that X is correct. It's not like those sources get a vote and the more votes is the one that's right. You have to look at each of those sources and see if you can weigh them appropriately to see whether X is right, whether Y is right, or hey, maybe both of them are wrong. We don't know. You know, we until we really go in and evaluate all five of those sources, we're not going to know if X is right or Y is right. Or maybe we need to be looking at something else and maybe it, it's actually Z. It's not a democracy. So again, look at those sources and always ask yourself if you can get to a better record and weigh those sources appropriately and you will have much better success in your genealogy. Next week on the archives.com live stream, we are going to ask the question, what are you missing in the 1850 through 1880 censuses? They are great census records, gives tons of information. Are we missing some of it? So we're going to tackle that topic next Wednesday, August the 14th at the same time, one o'clock Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. Until then, make sure that you stay connected with archives.com, whether it is on our blog, liking us on Facebook, following us on Twitter, and I encourage everyone to subscribe to our YouTube channel because then you will get emails about when we have posted the live streams to the YouTube channel. If you're watching this live right now, take some time later and go over to our YouTube channel where you will find all of our previous live streams. If you are watching this later on YouTube, I encourage you to join us on Wednesdays at livestream.com slash ancestry and join us in the chat room. We have questions and answers after the live stream. It's a lot of fun. I encourage you to join us then. Until next time, this is Amy Johnson Crow wishing you happy researching.